Next up, Bob Berninga, WB4APR. Title of his talk is Frequency and Other Initiatives in APRS Since 2004, which seems just like yesterday. I'm going to just talk as fast as I can about APRS, what's new, and a lot of things that are old in APRS, but the, the, the number one thing I'm going to get across, uh, and you've been hearing me stressing it for the last several years, and that is APRS is not a vehicle tracking system, never was intended to be so. It's supposed to be a single channel for ham radio, just like the internet is for other information. That is, if anything is going on in ham radio, then there should be a beacon on the APRS channel to inform everybody around them what's going on. Um, uh, what is APRS? Originally, it was the Automatic Packet Reporting System. That's the way it was named. I changed it to Position Reporting System for a while when GPS became popular, and then I regret that, and I've gone back to Packet because uh, the, this concept of vehicle tracking has just swamped us. Um, what is APRS all about? Again, human-to-human -human, uh, communications, and uh, when you think about all the different kinds of information we can exchange, Obviously, positions, status, messages, um, weather, and telemetry. Um, direction finding has been very uh, uh, disappointing to me that uh, ham radio doesn't do as much direction finding on the fly as you are. Uh, everybody thinks of direction finding as something where you've got to have a bunch of equipment. That's just not true. Um, typical applications are as varied as ham radio. Scope of APRS 30 to, uh, well, this was five years ago, it was 30,000 users, but we've kind of plateaued off because what we have is the same 2% um, of all ham radio operators are playing APRS, and everybody else says, well, I don't want people to know where I am. And my answer is, I don't care where you are either, because that's not what APRS is about. And this is the, the number one, this is a slide you get right at the top of the APRS webpage now, and it's APRS misconceptions. And all of these are links to all of these misconceptions uh, about APRS. And number one is that it's not a vehicle tracking system, it's an information distribution system for displaying to the operator everything going on around him, not just the positions of things. Um, and people think, well, I gotta have a GPS. No, the only people that need GPS are the ones that are lost. Okay? Uh, it, it, if you, the whole concept of APRS was we all share the same map display. But the concept, it, APRS was invented in the 80s, before GPS was, you, you could even afford it. And it was, the idea was that anything I put on my map, messages, text, anything, is shown on everybody else's map in real time. It was supposed to be that inter, uh, information channel. Um, how does everybody else, the other 98% of ham radio operators report their position? Very simple, mile mark. Mile marks are built into APRS, uh, uh, DOS, and UI view. But again, people don't use them because they think that, well, I can't transmit my position unless I got a GPS. Um, uh, and in too many of the clients le left out a lot of the uh, fundamentals of APRS, uh, primarily the decay algorithm. APRS was designed to, if something changes, I transmit it now and eight seconds later. And then 16 seconds, and then 30, and then a minute, and then uh, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, and on, on out. But new information that changed got higher priority, and yet every other APRS client, except for Exaster and one or two others, completely ignored that concept. They say, how often do you want to transmit? And so you put it for once a minute, and now you're transmitting stuff that's not changing every minute, which is a waste of airtime. Or you say, well, I'm only going to transmit it once every 30 minutes. Wait a minute, we've got a real-time event, and you're going to move the water wagon from here to here, and, and, and if the first packet is lost, it's going to be an hour before I see that moved? It's, it's absurd. So uh, a lot of the problems with APRS is some of the clients that were written just simply to put things on maps. That was not what APRS was about. Okay, uh, messages. The, the concept for an APRS operator at an event is you are a data input person, not an output person. You, everything you hear that's going on, everything that you see is going on, uh, on other frequencies, everything else, you're supposed to be putting that stuff on your map so that everybody else who's seeing the same map now has the same uh, information view that everybody else, it's the common view that everybody has. Uh, global APRS email, we've had it since 1993. Well, no, I guess 97 is when uh, Dempsey and, uh, and the Spruill brothers uh, tied it in, all into the Internet. So uh, we've had global uh, text messaging uh, in, in APRS, and since 1998, we've had a text messaging, global text messaging in ham radio. And yet people today are saying, you know, what we need is text messaging to uh, attract these youth because, you know, you, they're used to that. Why don't we have that in ham radio? We've had it for 10 years. Um, oh. 
what I like to do in a demo here is say, has anybody got a BlackBerry? You know, give us your uh, email address. And then somebody else, anybody got a D7? Okay, D7 operator, send him an email, okay? And a couple seconds later, as long as it takes him to text message, the guy on the BlackBerry should receive the, the email. You can email anybody in the world um, with APRS. Just do it from your HT. Um, global CQs, this is something we haven't had. We haven't been able to do a CQ field day uh, until last year. Uh, I suggested we need a, a global CQ, and uh, AE5PL, um, uh, Pete Lovell, uh, stepped up and said he wrote it overnight. And so now, if you send out a, a message to CQ server, um, and the first words of the message are CQXXX, now the CQ server will say, come back and say, welcome, I forget what it says. But if from that point on, now, anybody else on the planet that sends a message to CQXX, you'll get the, the message. So at field day, all you got to do is send one message, CQ field day. And now then you'll start getting messages from all over the planet of people saying CQ field day. CQ scouts, CQ Joda, CQ islands on the air, CQ school club roundup, CQ Saturn, CQ Skywarn. Uh, you can call everybody on the planet that has logged on. And you say, well, but you got to log on first. Well, duh. What do you got to do to listen to a CQ? You got to turn the radio on and you got to tune to find a CQ. That's the same concept here. You enter into sh your shack, just, and you're going to be there for a couple of, uh, you know, half hour or so. Send a, an APRS message to CQCQ and uh, just sit back. And if anybody else is out there in their shack, sends uh, a similar message, you'll see it. And uh, you can QSO anybody on the planet. This is my slide that says APRS is not just GPS. It was designed around maps. Everybody recognizes Dayton and the Hare Arena and the parking lot. The idea was you just put yourself on the map there, boom, instantly everybody sees you. You know, why do you need GPS to find yourself at Dayton? And in fact, back in uh, the, the 98, I, I can't remember which time frame, we actually got the, the, the Dayton Hamvention pamphlet, put the grids on there for us. And, and so, again, the idea was, again, when I show you with APRS touch tone, that you could, just with four digits, you can enter your position anywhere in all of Dayton um, without APRS, just using touch tone. Uh, that's what we were demonstrating back in 2001. That's about, I guess, when we got the grids added, but they've kind of, they don't do them anymore. So the reason I, I jumped at the chance to speak to this group is you guys are the innovators, you guys are the software writers. All I can write in is basics, so I'm, I'm a has-been. But I need the modern people that can really code and understand what this internet is all about to, to pick up some of these applications. Number one is APRS touch tone, and that is let's get the other 98% of ham radio operators that have a touch tone HT able to put themselves on the map with just uh, pushing one button, okay, uh, in their existing radio. And then uh, the automatic uh, vo uh, voice re relay system, I started this back in about year 2000 when I recognized that, wait a minute, APRS gives us global radio-to-radio -radio, uh, uh, messaging and signaling capability. Um, IRLP and Echolink gives us global audio connectivity. Why in the world aren't the two talking to each other so that all I have to do anywhere on the planet is say, I want to talk to W3XYZ, and I send the message on APRS. The AVRS engine sees that message. It looks where I am. It looks where W3XYZ is. It looks. It goes to IRLP and Echolink. Looks up the nearest nodes to them. Uh, sends a message to each one of us saying, "Your node is here. There's a frequency. Your node is here. There's the frequency QSY and talk." Now, um, as you'll see later, this is all part of why I'm, I've got frequency into APRS now, because eventually I want the the radios that have APRS in them to be able to receive a message that says QSY, and it'll automatically QSY and make the connection. In other words, ham radio cell, cell phone. We've got that today. The only thing that's missing is one person to write the code, because everything is there. Echolink is there, IRLP is there, APR is there. We know where everything is. The connectivity is there. It's just somebody to write that one program. I've been talking about it for eight years. <laughs> Talk is cheap. Um, so here's APR's touch tone. I've been, uh, I, built, I, I built this. Back in 2001 and demonstrated it at Dayton, it used a, uh, an external touch tone decoder chip in the DOS to receive the touch tone, and then I, I, I recorded every word of my own voice, and then so it did voice response, all of this in basic. And, um, but 
I only did that for a demonstration because even then uh, DOS is dying and I wanted to get somebody to write this for a sound card. So the sound card listens to the touch tone information and responds with voice synthesis. And that's all APRS is, data input, data output on a different frequency. So uh, the concept here is, you know, all of APRS is doing its thing over here, but the other 98% of ham radio operators in the club that can't play because they don't have APRS and never will, um, all it does is say, okay, send in your call sign by touch tone and uh, oh, live demo here. I hate live demos. It never worked. So I got my, I've got my radio programmed. Well, it just happens to be on the APRS channel. But let's say I key up. Okay. What I just sent was WB4APR. And you say, well, so what? That tells, that tells the global APRS network my call sign, the date, the time, my location, somewhere within probably you know, five miles of here because there, there was some APRS touch tone engine out there that heard that. Um, so now I've got a position, the frequency that I was on when I was heard, what the uh, tone was, what the echo link or ILP frequency is, and what the event is. So basically, everything you'd ever want to put in APRS was transmitted just by transmitting my call sign. Because the device, the APRS TT engine, which could be running on any laptop in this room, that received that, wrapped, took just the call sign and wrapped all this other stuff into it and sent it out on APRS. I've been talking about this for two, since 2001. Still waiting. Ah, except it's here. Next slide. So there's my call sign. And just, you know, I had to ask my teenager how to do it, you know. You just dial a uh, text message in your call sign, put it in memory location number one, and now whenever you come up on a repeater or a simplex frequency or anything else, well, not whenever, but when you want to be seen by the world as to where you are, just push your memory button. One button, and you're into APRS. Um, that button gets translated into this APRS packet that contains everything you ever want to know. Oh, and then you can push the B button and actually... Uh, indicate I'm on Interstate 95 at mile marker 234 northbound. But you have to input that data. Yeah, that, that is manual key. To, so you send your call sign first, de -de 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 and then you type in a couple of keys that says where you are, if you want to be very specific. In most cases, nobody cares where you are, but they, they know that I'm in Chicago now, as opposed to West Baltimore. Now, here's how it shows up. There's how it shows up, because now, remember, we've got all voice frequencies now tr uh, transmitting an object on APRS, so as, as a mobile and you're driving through Chicago or wherever, wherever you are, whenever you're within range of a repeater object, simplex range, uh, it'll show up on your map where it is, and of course, any APRS touch tone users will just be synthesized into a list so that they show up as a list on the map. Um, now, if you zoom in, they start ex expanding, but the, the, the sysop, when he sets up this uh, APRSTT site, he indicates that uh, I want all the call signs to be the right, to the right side of this. Or if you're on a mountain to the left of the city, you want the call signs to be on the left of the city. But in other words, you designate where you want that list to show up on the map. And the thing is, is nobody else has to do anything. Everybody else already has it. Because APRS is just going to receive that object as it was encoded by the APRS TT engine. So the beautiful thing is only one person has to write the code, only one person has to be running it anywhere, and every, everybody takes advantage of it. Uh, and here's out of the blue, I got an email last week from a guy in France that says we've done it, it works, and as soon as we can translate it into English, we'll send it to you. So, uh, and so there's his little list. The, ex using exactly what I asked for. Now, w once uh, I got excited at Dayton because I realized, wait a minute, every repeater in the country has a touch tone decoder and most of them have voice synthesizer. The hardware is already up there. All I got to do is talk to the guy that writes the software at the repeater and say, if somebody sends in just their call sign in text message format, um, put out this packet. And uh, I got one or two of them inst uh, interested, but, you know, it's kind of the chicken or egg. They don't want to invest all that time if this is not going to take off. Now I think it's going to take off because we finally got a software that anybody can do. Oh, and he wrote it as an add-on to UI view. So you're running UI view, and you get to run APRS Touchtone in your shack. Um, okay, so once it takes off, all you take, you could take a tiny tracker, put a, a Touchtone decoder chip on it, and voila, we got a little box now we can put anywhere. You know, you put it out at your special event, it's listening on 5-2, and anybody sends their tone, boom, they show up on APRS. 
we can put it in a micro uh, the open tracker and just hook it to an HT. So the um, again, a complete standalone system and, and very inexpensive. It can be stuck on a telephone pole. It doesn't even need laptops, UI view, or anything else to run. Um, so here's how it would look like at a special event. This is a Boy Scout event, and the Scouts go to all the different things. And here's the, uh, the three different frequencies that we're monitoring. Again, no, the repeaters are not right there, but for the purpose of this event, we've, we've put the, the, the 446 frequency there. I can't read this. The 145.2 frequency and this frequency down there. And now when anybody does the touch tone on 5.2, they show up here. So we always have a list then of who's on what frequencies. Here's the other one I've been wanting to do for years, and that is APRS RFID. The ARRL, and, and that's why in this room somebody knows how these RFID tags works. And I would, the concept is the ARRL needs to have a badge for under 20 bucks that we can buy that is an RFID that says our call sign. Because remember, if all I have is your call sign, the world knows everything about you. You walk through the door of the clubhouse, we know your call sign, the date, the time, where, where you are, what frequency you're on, what the event is, because all that stuff is added by the guy who programmed the thing at the door, okay? Um, the, the, again, the concept, situational awareness. We want to know everything going on in ham radio around us. Uh, now this was a little idea of a, a little solar panel, because uh, we want these things to have a range of about 100 feet. Uh, in other words, when you show up at DCC, everybody in this room, you should be able to go to a web page and see everybody's call sign. If you don't want to be tracked, turn it off. Uh, this is a very old slide showing that, yes, APRS is a radio and a PC, uh, or you can hook it up to your HT if you've got enough pockets, and uh, you can go portable. Or uh, in 1998, then Ken would put it all together in the HT, and now I'm saying any HT can do it because you can report in just by DTMF. And of course, ham radio operators love gizmos, and so what blossomed like mushrooms? Uh, trackers, standalone trackers, because it's easy to transmit packets, it's, it's harder to receive them. So now, this is what kind of started APRS on this slippery slope of being a vehicle tracking system, is because everybody want, went out and bought one of these little tracking devices, and now you're transmitting where you are, and nobody really cares where you are. So uh, uh, I say that trackers are a two-way system. If you're transmitting your position, you should have a speaker t with the volume turned up, and the frequency that you're on should be in that packet. And you can do that with any existing tracker. Just put your frequency in, in the, the, the beacon part of the, of the position report. And now as you're driving around, at least people can always call you. That's what APR ham radio is about. Um, and of course, APRS is global because uh, there, uh, anybody's house uh, can be an eye gate. And so anything that's heard goes anywhere. And of course, uh, if we have a satellite, which we do, uh, GEO32, you can get in from anywhere on the planet. Now, um, Kenwood uh, helped us out back in 98 by coming out with the, D7, uh, uh, the D7HT, and then they came out with the D700, which is a 50-watt version of that, and then uh, last year they came out with the D710, and what's new in the D710 is we added a, a column here so that if you're transmitting your frequency, it shows up right there on the front panel list. If you see somebody with frequency, you just push the tune button, and the radio instantly QSYs to that frequency and that tone, and now you can talk to the guy. Uh, number three, it, uh, it extend, extended the list to 100 stations, which you say, how can I manage that? Well, they gave you filters and a sort button. You sort by call sign, by distance, or by time, okay? Or there's a filter button, which I didn't highlight. You push filter button, and you say, I only want to see digipeters. I only want to see weather station. I only want to see mobiles. I only want to see IRLP nodes. And again, it'll sort them all up, and then they're uh, on the list of five is the five IRLP loads, nodes you're within range of. Um, other radios, the Alinko has been out, it has a TNC built in, but more recently uh, Scott uh, uh, of Open Tracker fame drops in, makes a replacement TNC and the advantage of it is it's two way just like the Kenwoods are in that all the position reports that are coming in get pushed over to the GPS display. So the GPS now can become the, your map display for uh, APRS. And of course via the uh, Yezu announced the VX8R at Dayton last year and I'm still waiting to see one. Uh, and of course, the ham HUD uh, has been out for a couple of years. Uh, the ham HUD is a ham radio project. You just plug it into any radio, the audio connections, and 
Again, you've got both send and receive and display, and it also outputs to the GPS. So that's a very inexpensive way to make any radio come up on APRS. Uh, now, of course, with the new D710, what a lot of people don't realize is that the display head contains the entire APRS function. So you can take the display head and plug it into any other ham radio, and you've got all of the most up-to-date APRS functionality. And here's an example where I've attached it to a walkie-talkie. Actually, I've attached a walkie-talkie to it, and uh, it's a $88 Alinko and a battery pack. And uh, now here's a picture of it attached to the top of a, a D-Star 2820 radio. Just set the left side of the radio to APRS. Do whatever you want to do on the right side, but at least you, you've got APRS and you still only got one radio in the car. Uh, if we can switch to video, this is my uh, D710 uh, control head. I just brought it with me, a little uh, walkie-talkie on the back. And the only difference that, that you have uh, in this detached mode is you don't have dual frequency. It's not a dual, ra dual band radio anymore. So what are they going to put as the primary display? This is it. And it's basically a list on the left-hand side of all the different... You've got 23 digipeters, 8 weather stations, 9 mobiles, 7 objects, um, what is that, 31 Kenwoods, and uh, no uh, Navitre stations. And on the right shows you how many messages uh, you receive, transmit, and ones that are waiting a reply. And of course, then you can select list, and I got the wrong pair of glasses on for this. So there's, there's your list. Uh, so uh, first of all, you see, I'm going to hit uh, sort, and I'm going to sort by call sign. And guess what pops up? The, if you sort by call sign, all the numeric objects show up, and what are they? They're the frequencies uh, of all the uh, nearby repeaters. So these are all the uh, repeaters that I've heard as I've been driving uh, here to Chicago. Um, but now let's do filter, and I'm going to filter by, let's just see how many digipeters are around. Click on that. And now this is a list of all the digipeters, um, and I can just sort them by distance. Sort by distance. And now, I, remember, I selected digipeters first. Now I'm sorting, and so now I'm getting assorted uh, uh, by, by distance as to how far away they are. And that one is uh, 331 miles away. This uh, control head hasn't been on since it's been in Chicago. But anyway, the idea is that, uh, oh, and you can also buy the control head uh, separately. They, they sell it separately. So in, in Ham Radio Outlet, can, can I say what they're selling it for, $199? You can buy the complete the D710 control head uh, for $199. And uh, now normally what's required, all right, let's go back to the talk. I think maybe I've got a picture. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, no, I don't have a picture. Uh, what you normally buy with this is a 10-volt power supply because it, it, it takes 400 milliamps to keep that display going. So the largest part of this is the battery pack. Speaking of which, I'm going to turn it off. Um, and so that interface uh, does all the cabling, but that makes it plug and play because it's a mini DIN connector and you know all the radios uh, from Japan for the last 10 years or more have had the little mini DIN connector on it. So you just take the control head, plug it into any radio and you're on the air with APRS on any radio. Next slide. Um, I, I brought this along because uh, you know the, the one laptop per child uh, is supposed to be a $100 laptop, but they don't allow it to be sold in the United States because it competes with um, getting you to pay $600 for the same thing. And um, uh, I thought this, because it runs Linux, it has a, a, a powerful uh, a Wi-Fi system, uh, it has a camera, it has, uh, audio, it has sound cards that go down to DC it has, so that you can use it as a voltmeter. It has a built-in oscilloscope, a spectrum analyzer. You know, all that stuff's built in for these kids that live in mud huts in Africa. And um, <laughs> now, again, out of the blue, just last week, uh, a fellow calls me up and says, oh, well, I wrote it. I said, wrote what? And he says, well, that application you asked for for the OLPC. I said, what application? He says, you know, the message thing. And I still didn't know what he was talking about. I said, yeah, I had that idea in my mind. And he says, no, you got a web page. And so I had to get him to tell me what the URL was for my web page. I went to it, and sure enough, uh, in fact, I started criticizing his layout, and he says, that's exactly the way you designed it on the web page. <laughs> so... Uh, just so this is less than one week old you can download it and it sits there and all you have to do is enter your call sign and uh, you can either enter your zip code I could enter the zip code of this um, hotel we're in and instantly to the global system at least people can see that I'm in uh, Elk Grove and uh, oh and it's a two-way messaging thing so I can send and receive messages and it's taking advantage of the Wi-Fi 
And I'm the last person, you know, that wants to be running around with a computer hooked to a Wi-Fi so that I can play Internet. What happened to ham radio, you remember? So I've always been that side. But now if I've got this thing and it's got Wi-Fi built in, then why in the world doesn't have APRs built in? Of course, also, you can load Exaster on here, which is the, uh, the Linux version of APRS. And uh, as, as soon as somebody can show me how to do that and it will load it on my uh, thing for me, then I'll be, uh, have APRs to go. Would you run that name by us again? Exaster. Does anybody else, is there a better pronunciation for it? Exaster. Is that how we do it? Because I only see, you know, we, we, we all communicate by email and see, I see Exaster. I don't know how to pronounce it. X-A-S-X-A-S-T-I-R. And what is it? An X version of APRS for... The, 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 the. Okay, now everybody, I hope by now, I've been talking about this for uh, uh, six years, I hope everybody knows what voice alert is. Is there anybody that doesn't know? Hold up your hand just so, okay, uh, I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> but, but basically, we got, we got 30,000 people driving around on the road, and they've got a receiver tuned to 144.39, and they got the volume turned down. Well, we realized that was kind of a waste of a radio. So several years ago, we said, turn the volume up and cut out all that packet racket, set CTCSS 100. Now you don't hear any packets, but we know if we see you on the map and we're in simplex range, we can just call you, and right out of there, out of the speaker, comes your voice. And so it's fantastic um, for commuting um, because I can talk. In the 30-minute commute, I might not ever get a word in edgewise on the voice repeater, but when I see somebody else coming towards me, I just go over to 144.39 and, and key up my microphone, and we can talk as a back channel. At first, we thought this is fantastic. You won't hear anything because of CTCSS. Well, duh, what you're going to hear is the other guy. Well, that's good news because he's only transmitting once a minute, maybe once every three minutes if he's a commuter. And during a commute, crossing like this, three minutes, 60 miles an hour, that's six miles apart between the packets that we're going to hear. And so uh, now driving to work, 90% 90, 90 of the time I don't hear a single thing. But if I hear a packet, I instantly know there's another person doing the same thing I am, and he's listening, uh, and it's like a radar ping. And so I can just pick up the mic, and I can talk to him. So, you know, you're driving through the, uh, southern Utah where there's nothing, and yet, you know, keep beaconing APRs once a minute, because if you pass within simplex range of any other APRS operator who's running voice alert, uh, you'll hear him. It's like a proximity detector. Now, APRS is all about local info. And by the way, at Dayton, uh, the AVMAP uh, G5 GPS people uh, uh, announced and provided, you can download the upgraded software so that um, the full uh, 200 APR symbol sets in color shows up on this GPS. So you just plug this GPS uh, into your, uh, any of your uh, APRS radios or your ham HUD or anything else and you'll see the full map display. You don't need a laptop anymore. The radio with APRS built in and the GPS is the map. Um, and we all know how APRS works. Uh, everything can relay off of everything. and. Uh, and, of course, the network was totally saturated and it was just wall-to-wall -wall packets and nothing could get through. And in, in 2005, we said, enough. Uh, it turned out the problem was um, du duplicate packets because of some of the earlier paths we were doing. As soon as we just said, we're going to stop doing those old legacy, legacy paths of relay-wide and go only with the wide-in algorithm where, um, so your path is just wide-in-in dash -in, and you, you decide what in is. And, of course, as a group, we say, just don't make N any bigger than 2, because uh, that's enough to get you seen by the nearest three or 400 people around you, and we don't need to see you in, L in Chicago uh, if you're driving around in Boston. So uh, that really, by a factor of 2 to 5, now you can be listening to an APRS channel, and you might hear 5 or 10 seconds of dead air. And that's what makes the network very reliable now, because you've got a high probability that your 5-watt tracker will be heard whereas before you'd get stomped on. So it, it basically revolutionized in, uh, since 2005, and every place that's invented it, uh, is implemented it, uh, just reports uh, glowingly how, how well it works now. Um, this is showing the major density centers of APRS, but you notice that there's activity everywhere. And uh, now this is a pet peeve of mine, and that is we're ham radio operators. What's the most important thing about ham radio operators? How tall is your antenna? Your wife might not care, but... The, um, the, um, so APRS, the fundamental part of your station was your latitude, your longitude, and your height above average terrain. 
Now, the thing is, is the most popular piece of software used by APRS operators, because it's fantastic on the web, it's fantastic with maps, it's fantastic with anything else, but it does not transmit your antenna height, and it does not receive nor display it. And to me, <laughs> what is ham radio and VHF without knowing, you know, so you've got a guy down here that, uh, that shows up as an icon, and he's got a range of three miles, because he operates uh, with a 10-foot antenna, and, and th th this... Uh, Circle here it belongs to that digipeter there, which is on a 600-foot tower, and they've got 10,000 to one difference in, in communications capability, and yet on this most popular software, all you see is two icons. You can't tell the difference between them. Uh, very frustrating to me. Because since every station has a range that's plottable, this is showing all the digipeters and how many hops it takes for a packet in, in range of those digipeters to get through, or you can see a path through there. Now, by the way, we decluttered the map about five years ago. We said, uh, Always, uh, when you plot the range, plot it at half the range. And you say, well, that's artificial. No, it's not, because if you're a mobile, that's all you're going to get. Because we're talking about packet and with flutter and everything else, you, you need a 6 dB. And remember, half the range is 6 dB. You, you've got to have at least 6 dB more signal on packet than you do on voice to communicate. So this, these are half the RF range circle, but they're about what they are for the mobile. But still, this digipeter can very easily communicate with this one because, remember, their circles to fixed location to fixed location are twice as large. So uh, we did it to get the circles down to realistic size for the mobiles, and a side benefit was now all of a sudden the, the maps look much better. You can still tell the, the big guys from the, from the little guys, uh, very little guys, um, but uh, you also get a, a decluttered map. And you can use this in all kinds of ways. Uh, this, I'm doing a packet trace, and so, oh, and this is back before the new, new end paradigm. This guy's driving around, or is that a fixed station? I can't tell from here. Um, he was transmitting his packets with five hops, so why do we need to see those in Baltimore when they're coming from North Carolina? Uh, we cut that out. We said, drop it back to two hops. Now, it turns out two hops in Maryland, you'll cover all of Maryland, uh, half of Northern Virginia, and uh, New Jersey. We, we don't need to be seeing stuff coming down from Canada on our simplex frequency. Once you've got uh, height above average terrain, uh, direction finding by signal strength is just a piece of cake. You just get on a frequency say, can you hear the jammer? And people say, I, no, I can't help you, I, I, I don't hear him. Duh, where are you? Well, I can't, you know, I can't hear it. That's the most important information because 90% of the people are gonna come back and say, I don't hear the jammer. But you know what his power height gain circle radius is, and so APRS plots it on there, and so these are all the places where the fox cannot be. And you'll have all that information usually before the first person reports in that says they heard it. And um, so this technique is, is built into APRS um, and, and so forth. Uh, another one that's built into APRS, again, this is the original uh, APRS DOS, is the, the fade circle technique. There's a jammer out here somewhere. You just start driving until you start hearing the signal. Remember that spot. Just keep driving until, um, until the signal fades out. All the way over here, it fades out. Okay, go back to the middle and either go left or right. In this case, I went right until the signal faded out. Now, you know that that's going to draw a, a circle with the jammer at the middle. Now, of course, we all know VHF, and we, we wouldn't believe that, uh, but at least it gives you a ballpark. So you drive to the ballpark, and now, instead of driving, well, let's go, go to the next example. So here it, at a club, I, I wrap a rubber band around my HT, and I set it out in the field, and then I go give this uh, talk at a, at a club, and I say... Um, all you do when you leave here, just start driving home. Uh, you, you know, I made it so you could hear the signal very weakly at, at the starting point. I said, just, keep, just start driving until you lose the signal. Turn around and go the other direction until you lose the signal. Come back to the middle, go one way or the other until you lose the signal. Then visual, visualize in your mind the center of that, go there. And as you start going there, the signal is getting stronger and stronger. Eventually, it gets so strong that now, instead of just not even showing on your signal strength, not even breaking squelch, now you get up to the point where it's almost full quieting. Remember that spot. Keep driving until it's no longer full quiet, uh, uh, you know, uh, all seven LEDs, till the next place where uh, the seven LEDs start flickering a little bit. And now go to the middle of that. Go either way to where it doesn't flicker. And now you're within a mile. And uh, then have your HT on the seat. Do the same thing. Drive, drive, drive. Then get out of the car. And, and within 15 minutes of, of the end of the meeting, somebody had found my walkie-talkie sitting on the field with a rubber band around it. Yeah. You had a function key to do that when you would hear the... Yeah, in APRS DOS, as you were driving, you could just hit the F5 key, 
F5 key, and then it would plot that stuff. But the whole point, once I realized it, you don't need APRs to plot this. It's just all in your head, you know. And uh, so I've got some examples. Um, this was a, a, one of these little uh, keychain transmitter balloons, you know. So, you know, no APRs, no nothing. And they launched it from a, a NASA kids event. And I said, well, aren't you going to go get it? And they said, well, we'd never find it. We don't have any, you know, don't have any DF equipment. I said, well, I'm, I'm about ready to go home anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll go get it. So, um, so I'm driving down the road, and, and, and all I know, all they know is it went north from where they deployed it. That's all they knew. N you know, no range, no nothing. And so I just drove north. I started here. I heard one or two little uh, squelch breaks right about in, the, in here. So I, I, I got off this exit, went in this way, didn't hear them anymore, came this way. Signal got stronger, got weaker, went back to the center. There was only one road, took that road and ended up in this chicken farmer's uh, yard. And so we got out and walked around. The strongest signal was right in the guy's backyard. The problem was um, this was all 10 feet of corn, and it didn't take me very long. Uh, well, first of all, we realized that uh, it's got to be out there in a cornfield somewhere. It didn't take me very long to realize you only go one way in a cornfield. And uh, <laughs> so I, I just wanted to get out of there. It was 100 degrees, and I, and I had on you know, shorts. I was just getting cut to shreds by the corn. And... Uh, so then I said, okay, I can go this way or go this way. I'm going to try this way. I went this way, came around. The signal's getting stronger and started getting weaker. Came back to the middle, started going in, stronger, weaker. Walked right over. I, I was six feet away from it before I saw it. But again, you can find a radio with nothing but a radio. It's, it's easy. It just takes a little bit of time. Um, here's another one. Uh, this one had an APRS payload, GPS, and everything else. The, the last known GPS coordinate was right here. So I drove to that spot. No balloon. Okay. Uh, of course, it was coming down at 1,000 feet per second or something because the parachute didn't deploy. So, and it, at only one position a minute, you know, so a minute before it hit the ground, it was over this spot. Uh, this is soybeans that are only one foot high, and yet I could not see the, that balloon until I was 15 feet away. But again, same technique. It, it had one of these little keychain transmitters on it. So again, I just walked back and forth, and, and you, you go right to it. Uh, APRS DOSH had the, the 3D display for, you know, the, the, the down here is the uh, 2D uh, track on the map, and this is the altitude display. I, I'm not, I haven't seen any other clients that implemented that. Uh, APRS has the built-in mile marks. You just uh, hit mile mark, up comes the mile marks on all the interstates, and you're talking to Joe on 146.52, where are you? He said, well, I'm between exit number whatever and whatever, which I can't see from here with my glasses. And so I just move my cursor there, click enter, type in Joe. I said, which way are you going, Joe? South? Uh, in fact, I don't really have to ask him this. He's probably already told me this. And so uh, we just keep driving for a half hour or so, and we're still talking on 5-2 uh, Simplex. I said, hey, it looks like you're about ready to come up on Interstate 70. He said, how'd you know that? I said, well, I'm tracking you on APRS. He said, well, how'd you do that? I, I don't have APRS. Yeah, but I do. Um, so uh, this is what I used to do back in 1994. Uh, you know, again, driving to Dayton, Everybody I'm talking to on 5-2, as I'm driving, and there's a gentleman in here that reminded me how dangerous this is, and I, I apologize if I didn't appreciate the sincerity of what you were saying. But um, so, so now when I go to Dayton, I always make sure I'm the passenger and somebody else doing the driving because it is tw uh, eight, eight, 10 hours of pure joy of just playing with APRS. So everybody that we hear on 5-2 and everything else, you know, they say where they are. They say what mile marker they are. I put them on the map and give them a direction. And APRS, the original APRS, dead reckons everybody. So everybody is continuing to move. And so an hour later, you can tell that Joe's should be, you know, coming up on I-85. Uh, I um, uh, we, we, we have, uh, there's a, a mile mark symbol, a symbol that will show up that you could put a two digits on it. That was for uh, traffic detectors. If, if we can get information on traffic speeds, we can display that on the APRS maps. And if we choose the names of them correctly, you don't even need a map. Here's Bowie, 50 West. It shows me the course and speed on the, uh, the screen of my HT. And as a commuter, I can just look at the screen of my HT, no GPS, no nothing, and I can see what the speed of traffic is through my favorite cho choke points. And so there's an APRS DOS version. You just go out there and put these little uh, dots on the checkpoints that you want to have monitored. And I gave up trying to find somebody that would write the code to tie it into the existing database, which already exists you know, from the Maryland Public Transportation, I said, I, I don't know how to do that kind of stuff, but I do know how to write basic. And so uh, by putting these dots out there now, 
uh, my APR software is just watching. Whenever anybody with APR passes one of those points, it grabs his course and speed, puts it uh, on the map, puts that object on there, and now the next guy that comes through sees what the speed was through the fa his favorite checkpoint as he's approaching it. Uh, oh, and there's a UI view add-on that does that as well. Um, now here's a, a thing, and that is don't think about uh, APRS's position reporting. Uh, we've got a special event here. Uh, Cub Scouts do the green circle. Uh, Boy Scouts do the red circle. We've got 20 stations, uh, 40 troops. I can't read this. Uh, lots of uh, scores to report every 45 minutes, and they spend the entire day on one simplex frequency by voice reporting those things in 20 users. And so for the last couple of years, I come out there with a, um, that's the DOS version of the map. I, I just put a D700 right there on the clipboard of the net control. Uh, forget the laptop. I always bring it along just so they can see a map, but they don't need that. Just the, the radio and the clipboard. And now uh, we load the, each, a, a, each D7HT at each station. We load the station call sign, or the you know station number five is the call sign there. And then uh, you just type in the um, troop number and the score and hit send. The little asterisk shows you that the message has been acknowledged. And this is what the net control operator sees on this clipboard right on where he's going to be writing down these manual scores. Now, of course, everybody in this room knows, well, we need somebody to write some software that will just automatically score the whole event, Excel spreadsheet, and you're done. Yes? Okay. But, who? Uh, you know, that stuff is always going to be written, going to be written, and going to be written. Here, you just go out and just do it. That's my frustration. And that is five minutes to go. Okay, next slide. Um, and, of course, it's the eye gates that make it uh, global, and once data is into the Internet, then you have all of the resources, the Internet, Google Maps, uh, and Google uh, satellite images, and, of course, you go to findyou.com, click on nearby stations, and it'll sort all the stations uh, in, by distance, uh, from you, and you click on any one person, you get to see exactly where they are, or at the bottom of the map, you click on show nearby stations. And this is just a little, like, kind of a 30 mile map showing all the activity around me in Annapolis. And uh, click on messages, and you can see everybody's messages. Remember, we've been doing text messaging for uh, 10 years now uh, from a standard ham radio HT. Um, it's all tied into weather systems. There's all kinds of uses. Here, you just put a TNC and a radio in a bucket, uh, in a buoy. Uh, throw it out in the ocean, and uh, go back to findyou.com. All your telemetry is recorded and plotted. You didn't have to write a single line of code. Because, again, lots of ham radio operators like you guys write data mining things to go in there and pull that data stream. Remember, every packet in the world goes into the uh, APRS Internet system and just a telnet connection, and you can monitor every packet in the world and write any kind of application you want. A typical, uh, of course, one, once we get into space, uh, you know, we've done five uh, ham satellites, APRS satellites. This is the one we're currently working on, a little CubeSat, four-inch CubeSat, except we're going to make it a one-and-a-half unit CubeSat. It'll deploy solar panels, give us four-and-a-half watts, and that'll be an APRS uh, 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 digipeter just like the other ones. And we're reserving half of it for payload, uh, and that payload is the person that's going to give us $50,000 then to build the satellite. But um, Now, but... Those satellites have various problems. Most of them have deorbited by now. But uh, TechSat 1B Geo 32 has been up for 10 years, and a year and a half ago they turned it over for APRS. The only difficulty is it's 9600 baud. Well, everybody that has a, a D7 or a D700 or a D710 or an Alinko uh, has a 9600 baud in their car, and you can hit this satellite with a 5 watt HT. You can't hear it because it's, it's, a, it's a weaker UHF downlink, but with an aero beam you can hear it. Or if you set your HT out there, twice a day you'll get an overhead pass, and you will get uh, packets for the center two minutes of that pass. Um, and you say, well, how do I know when it's going to be over? This is, uh, notice this covered from 1 August all the way up through October. Uh, the, the, the ground track of GO32 repeats every 10 days, so all you have to do is, is put, put the peak... Uh, pass time for each day, and then it repeats every 10 days. And so this covers about three months' worth of activity. And on the days when there are only two listed, this is the, a direct overhead pass, and this is an overhead pass. But you know that passes are every 100 minutes. So if there's only one shown, then that means there was a, there's another one 100 minutes earlier, and there's another one 100 minutes after that. But it keeps the table very small. Uh, Echo is the most popular amateur satellite. You can work this from your FM rig while you're commuting. All you got to do is know when it's in view. And people say, well, I got to have this track, that track. 
No, you don't. You need this little tiny piece of paper glued to the dashboard of your car, and it's good for about three months. Because uh, Echo AO51, the most popular ham radio FM satellite, repeats every five days. So all you got to do is just you know, mark off the days and just keep recycling. And so today, uh, this is the 25th, and today's the 26th, so there, there's where we are. Next. Uh, Another thing about satellites people don't realize is that when satellites first come uh, above the horizon, 67% of the time they're below 20 degrees. Uh, and it's only 6% of the time that they're above 45. So really, uh, you don't need uh, azimuth elevation antennas. You just simply need uh, to track in azimuth and have your antenna pointed up about 15 degrees. Next slide, uh, same thing. Uh, for, the, for the downlink on GO32, remember I said you can only receive it on a, on a whip for the middle two minutes? Well, but if I can receive every packet for the middle two or three minutes with nothing but a D7HT, why isn't my D7HT sitting on my windowsill 24 hours a day eye-gating everything that it hears on that frequency into the Internet? And if you do, all it would take is about six people all across the United States, and now any packet from any mobile in the country uh, will be picked up and go into the Internet. Um, I, I am actually almost done. We did some, uh, uh, some of you may know that I'm playing around with a Prius. The, the topic here is universal power supplies. What has crept up on us as amateur radio operators is that all uh, electronics these days are running on universal power supplies that will go from anywhere from 85 to 300 volts AC. But the only reason it has AC is because they had to submit it to the URL laboratories to have a test. And the test is AC. Oh, you want to have it tested for DC? That'll be another $5,000. So they only test them for AC. But what's the first thing every switching power supply does these days? Rectify straight into DC. So the thing is, is not just the Prius. The Prius has a 220-volt uh, DC uh, system. And 10 kW generator, well, it's actually a 50 kW generator, 250 kW generators in there. And how many hams have a 10 kW generator in their backyard or would like to have one? We'd all like to have one, right? Okay, it'll cost more than your Prius probably. And the beautiful thing about the Prius is you're driving your 10 kW generator everywhere you go. And I got two outlets on the back. One of them is for 220 volts and the other one is for uh, 110. And uh, my point being is start collecting those universal power supplies because they're like golden because all of American transportation is going electric. And every one of them is going to have a different power supply, but if it's anything above 85 and less than 350, you can just plug your laptop, everything into that directly. You've got emergency power, and you don't have to go through inversions and conversions and everything else. Um, I, through that zip cord, which is 150 feet long, it's just number 18 cord, which is the same thing that's in that orange extension cord, you know, that won't even fit in your trunk. It's still number 18 wire. Through 150 feet of that, I can draw a 5 kW and still be within the ratings of that wire as long as you pull it off the spool. Um, and my point is, there is no connection for a universal uh, plug these days. So I'm saying, take the 89 cent plug from Home Depot, drill a hole through it. Now, uh, buy outlets that don't have the ground plug, and then drill a hole there and stick a nylon pin in the center. Now, nobody can stick anything in there unless they know what it is. And this, by the same token, uh, this universal thing, you can plug into anything and it won't, won't hurt it. And so I've outfitted all of my stuff this way, and it's only using a $1 connector. And so I can show up at field day and run the entire field day site. Um, oh, and by the way, there are solar, there's 200 watts of solar panels on the top, so if the sun's shining, it, it's all free. And so there you go. APRS is not vehicle tracking. It is everything going on in ham radio. You should be beaconing onto the 144.39 frequency to let everybody else know what's going on. Can we get your PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, yes. You go to APRS.org. The first bullet is APRS by Bob. Okay. Uh, G, but that's the version last night. It's totally different now. But it, <laughs> it, it, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be different. It'll be later. Later today, I'll upload it. Thank you.